Hi and welcome to what will be one of two summer specials on Who's Zooming Who. Um, I've taken a break for a couple of weeks just to catch my breath after what's been a frantic uh, semester uh, and first, dare I say, season of Who's Zooming Who. Joining me this week uh, is a very, very special guest, um, one of the stalwarts of the online um, community and, and educational technology community in Ireland, Professor Mark Brown from the National Institute of Digital Learning in DCU. Um, I actually have, and he doesn't know this because I didn't tell him before I, before I started recording, I have a picture of Mark on my desk. It's not some sort of hero worship on my part. Um, it was that uh, shortly after he arrived in Ireland, one of the first jobs that he got was presenting me and some of my classmates with our master's uh, degrees. And, and DCU gave us this lovely photograph uh, of the occasion. So that sits uh, proudly on my desk at work. Um, uh, so without further ado, I'll ask Mark to introduce himself as well, now that, I've, um, that, that he knows that I'm fanboying on him. Um, so Mark, over to you. Well, thanks very much, Ken. Are you sure you haven't got some pins in that, in that <laughs> photo? Because I'm no, feeling no. a few pains in the back of the neck. Um, thanks for the invitation. And um, what we were discussing before we went on our line is that I have listened to all of the uh, podcasts. So I think it's a great initiative. Um, and it might be a good example of one of the positives of COVID-19. Um, as most people will know, if they haven't met me previously, tell from my accent, I'm not from these parts originally, although you did point out that I've been in Ireland in my seventh year now. So I guess I have a sense of what it's like to be in Ireland, but um, there's hardly a month goes by where I discover something else that I didn't know previously. But uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the time here. I um, moved from New Zealand. Uh, one of the main questions I get asked, so I'll get it off the table right now, is how come we moved to Ireland? I moved with my um, partner and wife, Denise. And there's a good professional reason, a good job, very obviously a good university um, to work with, a really innovative place. But on the personal note, um, we have four, um, well, I guess you wouldn't call them children anymore. They're grown up adults, but it was actually to get away from them. Um, so that's quite a genuine answer. Um, at a point where we decided, you know what, two of our teenage, well, two, they weren't teenage anymore, two of our sons in their 20s were still living at home. I said to my wife, if we don't do something, they're still going to be living here in 10 years' time. We need to move. So... Um, we moved and we haven't regretted it. Um, it's been a great experience. Um, hopefully, um, we've made a contribution, not just what I've been doing, but the unit that we have here in Ireland. And of course, we're living through very interesting times now. F br brilliant. I didn't um, remind me to talk to you about job opportunities in New Zealand because uh, maybe that's how I can finally uh, get, get, get out from under my adult children as well. So uh, never thought of that one. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. No, uh, look, uh, the contribution, um, I think, uh, I'm not just saying it as a, as a, as a graduate of, of DCU and someone that's done a small bit of work for you as well, and the contribution that the National Institute of Digital Learning have made, um, not just through the last couple of months in the COVID-19 crisis, but even um, I think the leadership and example that they've probably held up um, for the rest of the community and, and showing, I guess, what's possible um, uh, has been, I, I found it um, fantastic. So maybe like l looking back, I mean, you've, you said you've been here, uh, this is your seventh year now. I'm guessing the last six months have probably almost been as eventful as the, 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 the six years that preceded it. Um, in, in terms of the vision that you had when you when you came to set up the NIDL um, to where we are now, how has how how do you feel that's played out? Well, I, I actually think um, uh, that Ireland has matured enormously in this field in in the time that I've certainly been here, and I say that I'm kind of it's hard when you're in and part of the culture, but when I first arrived. I know with the team that we were wanting to create, uh, there was the memorable moment when we started to talk about visions and missions. And uh, I remember someone coming to me after a meeting and saying, do we really have to try to be world-class? Can we just like sort of focus on national excellence? Uh, and for me, that was a good indicator of uh, Irish thinking as others have interpreted it for me. But I think that's changed fundamentally in Ireland as a whole. Um, 
And I'm also uh, have been very conscious and as sensitive as possible to the fact that the national part to the unit that we have at DCU, that wasn't my doing, that was our president um, did that in consultation with a minister of education at the time. I think it might have been the four or five ministers ago. And it's a bit tricky having a national institute located in a single university. And at the time, um, perhaps there wasn't as much leadership as there is now shown by other parts of the sector. So um, I'm very conscious of needing to work um, together as much as possible. Uh, that doesn't work quite as well as I'd like it to. Um, in fact, in some respects, because I was director of a national institute in New Zealand, the National Institute for Teaching and Learning, uh, based in one university, there is historical things that why some institutes or um, individuals don't want to work with you as much as others. But on the whole, I think in response to your question, the state of, I'll say digital learning, since that's just the term that we have um, and what these terms mean is a debate in itself, has really matured. I think um, Ireland can be very proud and truly is leading the world in many respects. There are lots of things that perhaps we could do better, but given the level of funding that we have, um, and sometimes that level of funding actually forces you to be a lot more resourceful and innovative in itself. So for what a small country like Ireland is doing, I think it's starting to get noted. Um, you know, the National Forum is getting recognised in European circles. Um, I know that from just recent initiatives and invitations, our own work, yes, we do get quite a lot of recognition beyond Ireland, but there are other things going on. Um, IUA's work, I think, is really being noted as well. What can be done when you start to harness um, your resources in a small country? Because very similar to New Zealand, same population. If you can't do that in a small country, what hope is there for somewhere that's bigger? So we really, um, I think, have built a lot more unified and focused approach to the investment in new technologies in education. But this work's not done and it will never end. And that's probably one of the messages for politicians, policymakers, and funders. You can't just tick a box, perhaps institutional leaders at this time as well, and then say, ah, we've done that. We can move on to something else. This isn't something that's um, a finishing point. Um, it's a continued investment because what's defined as good practice or excellent, effective practice today will be different in the future. Sure, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. And and um, absolutely. I mean, even in terms of new technologies, new devices, new means of access, um, faster broadband speeds, make things possible now that wouldn't have been possible five or ten years ago. And I think, I think I said it on one of these podcasts, uh, or if I didn't say it, I certainly thought it. Uh, wasn't it great that it happened in 2020 and not 2010? Because um, we, we possibly wouldn't have been able to do as much uh, as, as 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 we've done. I think um, what's been really interesting for me, and, 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 and you, you called out a number of um, fantastic initiatives there, not least the, the National Forum and obviously the IUA um, Digital Edge pro pro project as well. Um, they've run a fantastic series of webinars. And, and yesterday they had, I think a student from DCU spoke on it, um, uh, who was their student intern, Vishkane. And it was really great to hear from a student point of view, because uh, as educators and as people working in the system, I, I guess we've kind of got a, a bit of a vested interest and in, sure, like we would say this, wouldn't we? It's, you know, um, but the, the hearing, hearing a student say, and, and uh, I have his quote here in front of me, it was the VLE isn't an option anymore. It's the superstructure for teaching and learning. And I thought that was absolutely um, inspiring to hear a student recognize the importance of um, this critical piece of infrastructure um, in, in their learning. Um, the fact that he happened to be a, D a DCU student, I guess, is, 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 is good for you. Um, in, in, well, there's in, a bit more if I interrupt you today. Okay, that. absolutely. Yeah, no, I think I'm I can say this. Um, actually, we've uh, just recently employed Vish, so his ah, very good. <laughs> way has come to an end. And uh, where you see talent, you, you see, well, you know, we need to uh, harness Brilliant. as much as we can. So um, this started a couple of weeks ago part-time and he takes on more of a full-time role, although he still will be studying in the new academic year. But we have a project, a funded project, um, 
our, at this year, there's an educational trust that seeks um, donations for honourable and supporting, um, you know, various projects. So we had a level of funding for some targeted COVID-19 research and implementation projects. So we were successful in winning one of those and Vish is working with us at the moment on the development of a MOOC on the FutureLearn platform, effectively on learning how to learn to be an online learner. So that's going to be available in September for the whole sector. Uh, IUA, an associate partner with that as well, with the student body at DCU. Uh, so we see that as a contribution more generally for Ireland. Um, and one of our arguments in putting forward that proposal is that learning how to be an online learner is a learning outcome now in itself regardless of whether you're a campus-based student or what you're going to do. Because to be a lifelong and lifelong, a life-wide learner in the future, you're going to need to be able to be doing that effectively online. Again, I couldn't agree more, and I'm going to sound like a, a, a parrot here, agreeing with you so much, I, I've no doubt, um, during this call. Um, my own, I suppose, experience of learning was coming back to education after being out of it for a, a very long time uh, and like that uh, my first kind of dipping my toes back into the water of, of learning was through a lot of the online MOOCs um, and the, the, the experience of learning online as opposed to learning uh, on campus um, is sufficiently different that if you don't recognize that um, and put in place the sort of right ideas to enable you to work and learn it more effectively right from the get-go you're, you're kind of um, you're, you're, you're at a massive loss the other thing I, I'm, I'm struck by um, and you mentioned the national role obviously that an uh, ideal play but um, I joked um, just a short few weeks ago when I had uh, one of your colleagues Eamon Costello on here I could probably have just people from DCU on who Zoom who all the time because there's that depth of talent there. And um, I, I'm always slightly, um, yeah, I think you're the third person I've had from DCU. And I know there's, a, there's at least three and many more that I could probably talk to. Um, so in, in terms of um, the talent that you have at your disposal, let's just say, uh, well, certainly I can say from, from my point of view, I'm desperately envious uh, of, 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 of what you've achieved. Um, but it also gives, I think, people throughout the country um, ideas to aspire to. And uh, one thing that has struck me, not just from NIDL, but right across the, the sector as part of the whole COVID response, there's, there's been an enormous generosity of people sharing their experience. Um, I, I think you were one of the first with, with your page, but I know that lots of other uh, colleges um, have been uh, very good in that regard too. Has that been something that you've noticed yourself or what, what are your own thoughts on that? I actually think that that's, uh, and I'll, I'll say this because I feel uniquely placed to make a comment like this, and it's probably very un-Irish to say so, but I think this is a trait of the Irish. Um, I do have a, another phrase that people know me, uh, they use all the time, which is all generalizations are dangerous, including this one. But I do think that um, generosity, it came through in all parts of the responses. I mean, we're seeing a little change now because we've, we've all been under the pump for so long or under the thumb. But for me, that was quite unique because the truth is we're living in a competitive, cooperative environment. There's a tension there. Um, institutions are competing on the one hand, but also there are um, carrot and sticks to collaborate. And so that's a kind of unusual tension. But in this case, what I saw unreservedly was people being just generous with their time, um, supporting others, reaching out, um, sharing their tips and advice. There, there was none of that institutional baggage in any form. So I thought that was a, a fantastic um, commentary on the values, if you like. I think I wrote that in a piece I, I wrote uh, a few months ago about, you know, it's not until the crisis you learn some of the values that are dear to, you, to yourself and also the society you live within. Um, at the same time, uh, I think if extend that further, because this is an important part of uh, my own personal philosophy and the ethos that we've tried to build, um, in the unit that we've got is first and foremost, actually I have this on my Twitter account um, as a banner, leaders don't build followers, they build more leaders. So um, 
we're now as a size of a unit because we've just made some offers to quite a number of new positions as recently as in the last few days, uh, over 50 staff. Um, and so we began with a reasonably core group um, and it's very hard to make the case for new staff, as you, most people will appreciate in Ireland. So that's, I take as a, um, a commentary on some of the work we've been doing. And not all of that work is DCU focused. Again, I appreciate the tension between um, being based in DCU, but also having some responsibilities beyond DCU. So the second part of that kind of philosophy is if we draw on the work of connectivism as a perspective or a theory, some would argue it's not a theory, but knowledge exists in the network. So um, this is where, again, I think the National Forum and IUA, um, also the Irish Learning Technology Association, all play roles, probably other groups that deserve a mention, I'll get hammered for not mentioning them, but those three come to mind immediately in playing a role in building that network. Um, and there is evidence of that, I think, in the COVID-19 response. Um, I did cite something from the index survey that talked about how some of the work that went on helped to provide the conditions, if you like, for some of what we saw play out. Had we not invested in some infrastructure um, and done other things, one wonders where we may have been. Um, of course, the unknown in all of these is some things would have happened anyway. We would have been using video, we would have been doing um, new things with different technologies, but I think the scaffolding and the network that was built to share that knowledge has made a difference. I, I agree, and I think some of it is even, um, I suppose, by individuals sharing their practice and saying, this is what I'm doing. Um, it might be it might be the, the push that somebody needs to get to say, well, you know, I can do that too. Because um, sometimes, you know, I think when you're trying to do something that you've never done before, it can seem very daunting. Um, but if somebody breaks it down for you and makes it sort of more more real, more tangible, um, and, you know, if... if uh, not trying to, 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 to talk down any of the efforts that people have, that, that have made, but, you know, if people are kind of making it seem relatively straightforward. Now, I understand there's a lot of moving parts behind it all, um, but if, if you can relate it to what people were doing anyway when they were in class, um, so moving some or all or bits of that uh, online, then obviously it helps. I know in, in our case, we were probably lucky in that, when, when the decision was taken um, to close the campus on, on the, uh, well, all the campuses on the 12th of March, um, our requirements of lectures were, were low enough that it, it wasn't an impediment for anybody to, to move the online. Now, I'm very conscious of they only had three weeks to finish out, so it wasn't like they were, they were trying to <laughs> in, invent a whole new course. And September is a slightly different challenge. But it meant that I think because people didn't have a huge mountain to climb, they were more inclined to try and go further than that. Um, and, and one of the r remarkable things for us was, uh, because we were able to point to examples of, of other universities and other colleges and other institutes of technology and what they were doing, it didn't make us feel like we weren't doing enough. Um, so it, made a, it, 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 it actually made it feel like we're all in this together. And you know, the, the one thing I suppose I've consistently come back to in talking to some of our staff here is that if you're communicating with your students, you're more than halfway there. Um, everything else after that is is almost a bonus because consistently the, 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 the feedback and even again yesterday at that IUA event, uh, that was something that students said that communication was, 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 was key to it all. Um, if I though want to just come in with a little bit of a, um, a brick bat, shall we say, because one thing I've learned about um, probably New Zealand culture, if you like, is that we're quite direct people. And uh, that was something I'm still uh, reminded of by my uh, colleagues that I work with. They don't always appreciate the full directness, but um, you can't be with anyone that you're not. So. 
I think we talk, we've talked a lot about the boat case, good things that have gone on, but at the same time, um, we wouldn't be doing a service and helping us move forward if we didn't understand where there's um, areas, shall we say, that we still need to address. Because the move, the pivot, to use that awful term, online uh, under a crisis is very different. It created an opportunity, and many have embraced the opportunity, but the underlying narrative or discourse, if I be a little academic, isn't all quite what it seems. So, uh, and I've written about this, and, and um, I, I see it as part of my job, and in some respects, so hopefully this um, doesn't sound arrogant, is I had the luxury since I'm not originally from Ireland, probably to get away with a few things that I can say. Um, and people might tolerate it a bit more than they might of others, or they just say things behind my back. But I actually see it as part of my job to say this, that the deficit language that has been um, almost accepted. In fact, I have a study underway with a couple of colleagues where we're doing an analysis of the way the media has portrayed the pivot to online um, uh, because that deficit language of emergency remote teaching, teaching in isolation, begins with an, uh, an assumption that face-to-face -face teaching is the gold standard. That's the default, and then everything else is a substitute, and it couldn't possibly be as good. Well, actually, that is not the case. There isn't, the research does not support that. Um, there can be very bad face-to-face -face teaching, as there can be very bad online teaching. It's what we do. Now, I'm sort of only telling pretty common sense what has emerged from the literature for years, um, 40 years, if you really want to date this back. Um, and some of what we did online under emergency circumstances was not great online pedagogy, to be truthful. And in my own institution, that's the case. Now, we, I'm sure, were all respectful of the pressures that everyone were facing, and I think the students were incredibly accommodating as well, because they had, were the ones at the end that also had to experience this and make the base of it. But we can't leave that where it is, because a um, couple of things really come to mind. Firstly, well, three things stand out. Firstly, the infrastructure that we have. I think it was quite clear that some institutions are better positioned than others. Um, there's actually a matter of equity here, even if you want to take it down to broadband access. Um, you know, I have traveled from time to time out of Dublin, probably not often enough. Um, it's a bit like Auckland. If you live out of Auckland, you know the real New Zealand. And when I do get out of Dublin, I realize how different Ireland is than living in Dublin. But also, I've realized how slow the internet can be. Um, so that's, that is a fundamental infrastructural equity issue. The second thing is that um, it's really about mindsets. And uh, again, this is a well-known established um, element out of the research that pedagogical beliefs, the philosophy, the um, orientation of the instructor, the teacher, mediates how they use any technology. So, you know, I could use PowerPoint to, yes, talk down a pipe as I've talked previously about, or I can use it in quite innovative ways, embedding quizzes and polls and all sorts of things, following a different kind of pedagogy. So if you don't address the mindset, um, then you're not really going to harness the investment in new technology. And if I was in an institutional leadership role and I'm looking at a budget, why would I throw a lot of money at new technology if all I'm going to get is old pedagogy delivered via new tech? And then the third thing that comes to my mind um, when I'm talking about this is we have a great opportunity to really look at, um, I'll localise it to the individual institution, and the drivers for why we might be investing more in new technology and the culture that's wrapped around it. Because um, I know this is a bit of a cliche, it's not well empirically grounded, but culture each strategy for breakfast, lunch, and probably dinner. So if you haven't got the right organizational culture, well, actually, there isn't a single thing as an organizational culture. It's made up of lots of subcultures from all the different units and the like. But if your culture's not aligned, uh, again, you have to ask, well, what are you doing and why are you trying to achieve? So those are really big issues. Uh, and there's nowhere that's really solved those. Um, and there isn't an end point again. But 
Um, the one thing I do enjoy, and this is not intended to sound DCU centric, but I enjoy working at DCU because the culture has enabled a lot of innovation and a lot of free space thinking. So as an example of that, MOOCs tend to polarize people. Um, there's not been a national, really a strategy around MOOCs in Ireland. There was some early conversations of what we might do nationally in that space. But at DCU, MOOCs have been the playpen to try new things out. They were never, uh, when we, we were quite latecomers, we did a lot of thinking about why would we bother wasting energy and finances and human resources for MOOCs. But the end result was because it's a place to innovate and learn. It wasn't driven by any idea that we could get ourselves promoted around the world as typically the Ivory League institutions have done. And we have learned so much from MOOCs that we have been able to bring back into not just our normal online teaching, but even campus-based teaching. So um, that culture is really crucial. Yeah, no, as, as you mentioned MOOCs, um, I think one of the first events that I might have met you at um, was you had a, a MOOC posium uh, in DCU back in 2015 maybe or 2014 I can't, I can't remember what it, what it was but it was really really interesting and for a long time I had um, a self-proclaimed uh, MOOC addiction um, I'd sign up for all these courses um, just e even if the title looked remotely interesting um, I, I signed up um, I signed up well sometimes I felt that if I just signed up that was enough that that that, that the, the knowledge would arrive by sort of some sort of osmosis that didn't work um, I did find that some of them I had to do funny enough actually the, the after signing up for what seemed like a million MOOCs and never finishing any of them um, how I actually managed to and I, and I have finished them since I'm glad to say um, but how I managed to actually do it was I, I had to sit down and put the dates in, in my diary so that um, I, I'd actually do the work each week. Um, I, I, and that was just the, the kind of learner I was. I found that trying to do it any time, if I, if I tried to do something any time, that means I did it no time because, um, you know, any time could be, as, as the word says, at any time. But yeah, no, I think uh, the big interest for me uh, and what kind of probably fueled my MOOC addiction was seeing how things were done, seeing how things were presented, seeing the, the, the sort of structure behind things and, 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 and the, the, the way they worked out. And I am seeing some examples of that filtering down into, into um, regular online learning. Of course, you're absolutely right about the deficit language that, that sometimes can be used for online. Um, and I've even tried to stop myself from saying face to face because you know, we're online at the moment and I can see your face and you can see my face. So this is face to face as far as I'm concerned. So I, I tend to use online and on campus uh, as opposed to online and, and face to face. Um, and again, look at the terminology and its language and maybe I'm getting a bit pedantic about it. Um, but given that my own master's that I completed with DCU was entirely online, I've a vested interest in, in saying that online is <laughs> every bit as good as uh, every bit as good as, as, as an on campus experience. I think at the end of the day, it's, 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 you know, you can't take, you can't take a bad teacher um, and put them in any environment and, and make it good, whether it's face to face or on campus or whether it's face to face online. Um, it, it is about that uh, caring and compassion. I'd actually go, go so far as to say a lot of the time what happens online, um, I'm going to be slightly contentious here and say that in it it has the it has not only does it have the potential to be better but a well-designed online course probably is better because it's far more deliberately constructed um than what happens um on campus um there are certain things that just happen almost by a happy accident uh, on campus and and lots of educators depend on that whereas to make those kind of things happen online you have to, an educator needs to be far more deliberate um, to create the conditions um, for it to happen. So, you know, the example being the kind of spontaneous class conversation that you might have in a, in a physical classroom, in order to make that happen online, you've got to seed uh, and plant um, discussion forum for a post or Padlet post or whatever tool you want to use uh, much more deliberately. Um, so I'd even go to so far as to say that, yes, the, the online experience um, deliver properly, uh, far from being deficit, can be 
um, superior to, um, well, and, and, and it has other affordances as well, of course. Well, I was going to say, in, in many respects, uh, I don't see that binary, and that might be, I hope, one of the outcomes of COVID-19, that we, we don't return back to there being an online and an offline world, and they operate in parallel and never come between. We're seeing reference now to hybrid as distinct from blended. Yes. Um, but uh, for me, I just go back to first principles. Um, who are your learners? Know who your learners are. Secondly, what are your learning intentions? Or some might say learning outcomes. I, I prefer to call them intentions at that point that before they actually become outcomes. And then choose the appropriate methodologies, pedagogical methodologies, the delivery, according to what you're wanting to achieve. Um, and in most cases, I think that's probably going to have an element of campus delivery and online. Of course, there are some students who do not have the luxury of um, being able to attend the campus. And that's a, another nice feature that um, I appreciate about working at DCU because it's had a very long history of offering distance education right back to its inception when it hosted the National Centre for Distance Education. I came from a university that had 20,000 online distance students and 20,000 wow. campus-based students um, over 50 years history. And that was driven by an agenda of social justice, access, um, and, and that's deep in, in DCU's DNA, again, which is one of the reasons that resonates with me. But the reality is that we could not meet the world demand for higher education um, by continuing to build campuses. And I'm taking um, Ireland's mission, if you like, as a small country that stands up for itself for the right thing. Very similar to New Zealand. That's why um, it's fairly comfortable living here. It's quite easy transition, to be honest. Similar values, because we're both colonized countries if we want to go down that route. Um, and so we generally uh, look at things and, and take this view of trying to do the right thing. And so I think what we're doing with new technologies in education, we need to now be thinking about how we can make a contribution beyond our citizens of Ireland. Um, and that's another aspect that MOOCs have to it. At the moment, um, we're heavily involved in the micro-credentialing movement. And I draw a very important distinction between micro-credentialing or micro-credentials that are stackable and credit-bearing as distinct from, say, warm body badges. Um, uh, but that movement just last week got a really good lift with the European Commission's new skills agenda, where action 10 of the new agenda is to develop a European-wide approach to micro-credentials. Um, I'm actually serving on the consultation group, so uh, we'll see something come out of that. And I think that's where the online fits, because just in time, just enough, um, it might be distasteful for some people to use the language of earning where they're learning. But the truth is that people do need a job mm -hmm. and higher education isn't free. Um, people are also wanting to learn at their convenience that fits their life. So um, I'm not sure about other institutions, but we've certainly seen a trend at DCU, and this is part of a global trend in developed countries of postgraduate students wanting to increasingly move part-time and do that kind of way of learning. So I suspect that that will be a legacy of um, COVID-19 in Ireland. Um, Springboard is an initiative that probably will give that even further catalyst, but of course everything's got an online dimension from here on in for the next um, probably six months. So I hope that we take advantage of that. This is not to say that a campus-based education is an important, particularly for those who are leaving school, because there are lots of things that go on in university that are more important than what happens in the classroom. Yes. <laughs> yeah, including in the college bar. Um, probably particularly in the college bar, when I think back to... To, well, that said, the, the college I went to, we didn't have a bar. We, we wanted to have a bar, but we didn't have one. But we, well, we, I, I'm going to interrupt you, Ken, because that's another nice cultural um, distinction. Campus bars got shut down quite a long time ago in New Zealand. Oh, really? <laughs> um, so I remember when I first moved to DCU and had a bit of a tour and they pointed to the campus bar and said, oh, it doesn't really open, I think, until 10.30. And I was just staggered because um, in New Zealand, we would have had to have a liquor license to be able to serve alcohol on campus. And under the legislation, 
um, the person who took the liquor license out because the institution couldn't do that had been named individual okay. was the one that took responsibility if anything happened. Ah. <laughs> part of the liquor license, you took responsibility for getting the people home safely. Okay, okay. Uh, so it completely killed that side of campus life, if you like. So um, I'm pleased to say that Ireland has retained these important traditions of study on <laughs> college campuses. But, but it, 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 there is still a bit of a divide there, uh, Mark, in that... Um, so when I would have went to college way back when, um, what, are the, what are the IOTs now would have been what were called regional technical colleges. Uh, and none of the regional technical colleges had a bar on campus. Uh, I think my own campus, my own college now, WIT, was the first to have a bar. Um, and I'm not even sure how, and I possibly is still one of, I, I, don't, I actually don't know if there's any of your other IOTs have a bar, but that was the, 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 the full the full-blown universities, the UCCs and the UCDs and um, DCU, obviously, and, and UL, that was the, the distinctive piece about um, the, the full universities. They had bars, so, the, so they were for the real grown-ups, whereas, uh, <laughs> uh, where, where, whereas us, us we were kids uh, went to the, well, what were the RTCs uh, at the time? But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, as much as I'm an advocate and, and fan of online education, I'm not so blind to, to think that it's for everybody. Um, I think the, the, the points you made there about earning and learning uh, are very well made because prior to my coming back into, into, into this role and back into working in, in education, um, I worked in industry for a long number of years and the thought of you know, spending time in, in a classroom was just, yeah, well, why would I want to do that for when I've got a job to do? Um, so being able to, to, do that sort of, um, to do that sort of work online, and predict, particularly in the area of micro-credentials, I think that there's, there's a huge potential there. I know that you launched a, a FinTech micro-credential on FutureLearn just recently. Um, how, how's, how's that going for you so far? Or is, it just, is this a, 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 another kind of one of these dipping your toes in the water to see how it's going to go thing or? No, this is quite a strategic um, initiative and, and we should point out that micro-credentials are not um, needing to be delivered exclusively online. We're actually uh, next week launching a national survey in partnership with um, a government agency on, on micro-credentialing. I'm doing a, a webinar uh, actually, I'm doing two webinars, one on Monday for a group in Europe and one on Tuesday for SkillNet uh, in this area. Uh, in Australia, the government has um, put quite a bit of funding into micro-credentials as part of their COVID-19 re re recovery strategy. Um, there's a recognition that people who are out of work don't need to do a full degree to get back sure. into work. They need maybe there's a skill gap as well. Um, the critical part, though, is this is a pathway for learning. Um, so in that sense, it's a lifelong uh, stackable pathway. Um, I often see and describe this on a sort of vertical axis of micro-credentialing. There is a horizontal axis that maybe um, does involve certificates and badges and the like, and these don't have credit bearing. Um, and there's a place for this from a life-wide learning perspective. But... Um, the focus of the work that we're doing and what the Commission's working on is much more stackable and credit-bearing. And you can argue that micro-credentials have already existed. A postgraduate certificate is a micro-credential of a master's. And actually, uniquely, the Irish qualification framework already accommodates alternative credentials. Um, so micro-credentials plug in that DCU. We've already changed our regulations to recognise what a micro-credential will be. Um, currently, internationally, there's no definition that's accepted, but that's what's going on right now at the European Commission level. And I predict that what comes out of the European Commission on this occasion will actually have quite an impact globally to have a common standard of what we mean by micro-credential. Uh, and I think that, that, that that's important um, because, again, you know, having that sort of, sort of something that people can benchmark, and I think that's part of you, you 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 touched briefly on digital badges there at one stage and i have to admit i was a fan of digital badges as well but because they mean different things to different people um it, it there, there wasn't that sort of the same currency maybe that you would have with with a properly um with a properly standardized definition of what a what a micro credential is you, you touched a couple of times there on what um and you just mentioned the the, the australian response to coming out of COVID, um, 
looking ahead, I suppose, look, we're, we're at the start of July now, or the first, the end of the first week in July. Um, we're still five or six weeks, um, seven weeks maybe, uh, off going back on, uh, on, on, on campus in September. Uh, and I think most, uh, most Irish HEIs have decided that the end, the end of September, start of October is the time when things will notionally start again. H how different do you think this coming year is going to be um, in comparison to, we'll say, what's gone before? Um, but in, in a general sense of what's gone before, but but also coming out of the back of, of, of last semester. How how different do you think things are going to be? Um, yeah, you really asked me to look at the crystal ball. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, but, yeah, but... Um, uh, I mean, my concern is at a sort of societal level is as we're starting to take the foot off, if you like, our self-discipline. Um, and, and New Zealand's the place to be right now, putting it bluntly. I can't get there uh, because they won't even let us in the, in the country anymore. They've just this in the last 24 hours have started to block flights um, because the lesson is that a country that had no um, cases, all those cases that have arisen in the last couple of weeks have arisen because of um, people coming in. So they're not community-based. But, you know, Ireland is a country that's a great travel hub. Um, and if we're not careful, that's going to perhaps lead to an escalation. And, of course, we saw some of the activities over the last um, weekend or so uh, of how people, I guess, are just naturally having a bit of release from our um, cooped up existence. So I have to assume on a worst-case scenario, at DCU, um, what our senior uh, management have done and developed, I'm sure, as many institutions have, different scenarios for different um, circumstances. And you have to work on the worst scenario and then work backwards. Um, but at the same time, um, and I, I hope you know, other institutions have seen this as an opportunity to look and take the longer term horizon. So for my mind, um, if all we do is focus on getting us through the next semester, which is absolutely crucial and you know, a commitment to the best possible student experience, but we can't take the long view and see where we can take this further, then we're missing a great opportunity. So whilst I can't predict the future, the mere fact that DCU's invested in um, quite a number of new positions, um, that's not just to get us through the, the crisis. We're actually developed a whole new unit. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, we see that the digitally enhanced experience, however you might describe that, um, is now the new norm. And another element to it is, if we look at some of the other drivers, um, Ireland is the youngest demographic in Europe. There is a bubble still to come through in the sector. Uh, we already struggle to fit students into enough of our physical spaces. So to accommodate that bubble, I can't imagine that the government's going to make funding available to build new buildings to accommodate. So the digital dimension has to be part of that solution. So all in all, I think we just have to be as optimistic as we can. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature and we will make mistakes, but I'm also very confident that if we trust our staff, and give them the best support that we can, then they'll try the hardest to give the students the best possible experience. And of course, the students themselves have a role to play in this. So when I was referring to our, our MOOC that we're developing, one of the unique features of that MOOC, I don't want to overpromise it, um, but actually is we have this intent of a MOOC designed by students for students, because Ask a student, as you were saying in Vish's case, what else could we do to support your experience? What other tools would you suggest we might use? There are lots of tools that they already use, and that came out of the index survey. Um, and I know from my own experience where I was involved in uh, video interviews of first year students on a weekly basis, things that we had no idea they were using that we don't support. So I just think we have to um, be kind on ourselves. Um, you know, we're all probably suffering right now from the need of a bit of sunshine, heaven yeah. forbid, because we certainly haven't got it today on the day of this interview. And, um, you know, if we just don't overcomplicate matters too much, people teach in physical classrooms. We trust that they will do that. Not all of them do it as well as we would like. 
but most of us are products of that teaching for better and worse. Um, so um, at least giving it a go, um, it's not going to be uh, long term that harmful. And I'm very confident that both the students, our staff and those who support our teachers we end up getting through this and we'll hopefully take some very valuable lessons forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think uh, that's probably the thing that's encouraged me the most is that um, a lot of the time when I would have been working with staff, trying to get them to use some of the online tools, even in, in, in an offline setting. So just, just using the digital tools that we make available to them. There was always a great reluctance in that it was like, but sure, I don't need to use it. Why, why would I bother? Um, now they've, they've needed to use it. Um, and I'm hoping that they'll keep using it even when they go back to um, standing in, 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 in uh, classrooms. Um, the other point you made about asking students, um, I think it's remarkably powerful. And I think sometimes, uh, maybe it's an Irish thing that sometimes we're afraid to ask the question because we mightn't like the answer. Um, but there's also an element of, well, if you ask the question, you might get an answer that you didn't anticipate or expect. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's believing that both things are possible. And, you know, if, if you don't like the answer you get, then maybe you need to ask a different question or, 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 or frame things, frame things differently. Um, I was very encouraged um, right across the sector, no more than in, in, our, in our own institute in, in WIT, at how involved students got um, in their learning um, during the, 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 the COVID uh, closure. Obviously, the, I'm, I, I can't be certain yet how the new students, so the students that have never been to the campus, how, how they're going to, 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 to adapt uh, or exactly how they're going to be accommodated. But... I suppose I'm mindful of the fact that how their leaving cert was different for them as well. So they've already experienced some difference. Um, so it's not like, you know, we're not comparing apples with, uh, ap apples with apples here. It's, 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 it's a slightly different, uh, it's a slightly different um, comparison. I do think that I, I, I hope um, across uh, the sector that, um, there will be a recognition of the benefits of investing in, in the digital technologies. Um, you know, it, it always strikes me that the, you see announcements being made of uh, tens of millions on sports centers and new physical buildings, um, but you never see uh, the big announcements about money being spent on the digital uh, infrastructure. Um, I do. There's a flip side to that, if I just come in on that point, because this was something that came out of the index survey. Um, video and my example previously or uh, point about how mindsets matter you know video is a great example you can use it for a talking head or can you use it for an engaging panel discussion those are quite different pedagogies uh, underlying pedagogies um, in the index survey there was effectively the students were asking for more recorded um, video in my last university the very last project I led was five million investment in what some might call lecture capture. Now, that's, I'm going back 10 years, effectively, when that project first got underway. We didn't call it lecture cap capture because you've already uh, learned to, my colleagues know language matters to me, hence DCU connected and loop. We called it rich media learning because we wanted to focus on learning, not capturing lecturing. But at the same time, that project was largely driven because the students said they wanted it. And it's not a popular thing to say, but just because um, people say they want something isn't always the reason to give it to them. You know, when you go to the supermarket and you see all the lovely things on the shelves, sometimes you're tempted to buy something that might not be that good for your nutrition or your health longer term, but you kind of get sucked in. So um, the lack of, say, investment currently in more traditional lecture capture might not be a bad thing. It's certainly not something that uh, up until now we've prioritized at DCU in that traditional um, way that you might hear about it as just capturing an old pedagogy, lecturing with a new technology. Yes, the technology of lecture capture, or well, let's use the word rich media learning, can actually be used for other purposes. And um, you know, there's literature reviews that demonstrate that. But the other part to it is, when we're talking about um, 
first year students in particular, they, I think they are the ones that will have the biggest challenge and they're the ones we probably need to put our greatest emphasis on. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that even at Harvard, and I'm citing a published paper here, less than 50% of students attend physical lectures. So um, there's another takeaway for us that, again, just to return back to what we've done previously on the assumption that that is the gold standard, here is the opportunity for us to rethink the mix. Um, actually, I'm a great defender of the lecture. There is no such thing as the lecture because people use that methodology in so many different ways. And sure. if I wasn't a defender of it, then I could hardly look at myself in the mirror when I've been invited to give a keynote and go off and effectively give a lecture. Sometimes they can be quite effective, not always, yeah. of course. Oh, absolutely, and, and, and some of the most engaging educator experiences that I've ever had myself have been what, what we call the traditional lecture. Um, it, it's interesting when you say about, uh, when you ask the students um, what they wanted and they said le lecture capture or, 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 or words to that effect, I, I'm minded of the, the quote from uh, Henry Ford who said that if, if, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, so um, yeah, sometimes people don't, they don't know what they want uh, until they get it. Um, and I guess uh, when you say about, uh, and I think that, that maybe the missing link um, within the the online experience at the moment uh, and I, and I, I don't I don't have an answer to this maybe maybe you do but you said about 50% of Harvard students not going to lectures but they're still physically wandering aimlessly maybe around the campus and bumping into each other and bumping into the the, the furniture and, and 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 the amenities and facilities maybe we don't have that 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 space to wander online um, you know, um. <laughs> well, if we if we want to turn that into something that maybe people who are listening to this might resonate, is that we're all part of a learning organisation. Because assuming that you're working within a college of some kind, so um, in that learning organisation, we have opportunities for formal learning. We usually run professional workshops, non-formal learning, but probably I would argue most of the kind of valuable stuff happens in the corridors. Um, when it comes to professional learning, I prefer the term professional learning than professional development, I have argued for many years that the test of how effective you are is have you got teaching and learning being talked about in the tea and common rooms and the corridors. That's what the kind of culture you want to create. So um, what our team has discussed is how we're missing those opportunities to just have a chat down the corridor, even for more formal things about or passing on information. And uh, we've tried to replicate some things um, with mixed success, uh, even just to have a bit of fun. And of course, we've, uh, as an aside, we've got a study that we've started around the affective dimension, how people's emotions uh, have responded because we have a particular interest in that relatively new area. And so we, we ran this um, for several weeks, Who Am I? competition. So we started on a Monday um, and um, someone took, I, I, I kicked the ball off just to try and sort of get people to have a bit of fun, to be quite honest. Um, if you don't have fun in the workplace, we all work very hard, but I'm a great believer in, you know, creating a culture where people can enjoy themselves at the same time. Um, and take fun and make fun of yourself, actually. If you've ever seen any of our um, infamous Christmas events, um, then you'll know what I'm talking about. But um, this then was passed on. Whoever won it that week, they got a basket of cheese delivered to them, couriered to the house, and then they took on the who's, who am I the following week. Usually it took about two to three days for some people to guess, and that was done on a Google Doc that they guessed backwards and forwards. But that was to try to mimic some of the things that we would just do you know, in the corridors as such. And I, I do think that's something that we've probably missed a bit. Um, I know that there are gaps in my own knowledge of what's going on that normally I would just see someone in the corridor or across the, as I walked across campus and ask them. So um, that's an example for our learning. And equally, I think that applies to students. Yeah, no, we, we, we did try, um, and actually some days were better than others. So during, uh, when, when our academic staff were still working, because in the IOTs, um, they finished on the 20th of June. So when they were still working, um, 
pretty much for all of the remainder of the term, we used to run daily uh, what we call virtual tea rooms. Um, and it was just literally a Zoom room that was open for an hour and a half. And people could drop in. There was a colleague of mine, Pete, Pete Windle, um, ran it. People could drop in. Some days he had quite a few. Other days he didn't have so many. Um, and it was literally just, I suppose, being mindful of the fact that people were were working at home, isolated from their, their typical uh, normal colleagues. Uh, and this just gave them an opportunity to, it wasn't a meeting, even though it, took the, it was using the same tool that were used for meetings. But if, if they wanted to drop in for five minutes or if they wanted to drop in for half an hour or if they didn't want to drop in at all, it, it, it was good. And some of the conversations actually that came out of that were, were, uh, were, ap- were absolutely fantastic. Um, the other so, thing so is- I know at DCU, just to interrupt you, taking this line of conversation, we've put today as much emphasis on our sports and societies and how we can mimic those social groupings, those micro groupings, in what we're planning for the new semester very good um, than the what we're doing in the classroom yeah. because in many respects you can have some confidence that people have a curriculum and they have certain outcomes and assessment but how do you create those other experiences and um you can design for that but whether people will come is another matter yeah but i, I think even the, the, the fact that that it that it's been thought about um that that and that it features in the planning um is positive um it's interesting when you mentioned there about the, the sort of learning that happens um uh, almost by the way um w- within a learning community because one one of the academic staff that works closely with my own unit um his his unofficial title is tea room evangelist um and his 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 job is to sit at the tea room in the college uh, and anybody who listened to him um, to, to to kind of spread the good news about what what's possible online. So, yeah, no, it's 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 really interesting to hear. I'm fascinated to hear uh, about planning for for the sort of clubs and societies and and getting them more involved in in, in the online bit as well. And um, I must follow up with 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 some of the people in our own place and see. I, I think that they are doing some work in that regard. I'm very conscious of I've I've taken up an awful lot of your extremely valuable time and you're, you're, you've, you've been very um, facilitating and f- fantastically interesting as always um, in, in, in hearing about the experiences uh, of what got us to here and what might happen in, in the future. Um, all that remains, sorry, Mark. You go. Well, I was just going to say the only thing I, I haven't done, Ken, is on my list of what I um, had to do was um, replicate what my good colleague Eamon Costello did was turn the tables on you. And he <laughs> turned around and interviewed you as part of it. But I yeah. won't put you on the spot. The, the uh, yeah no he he kind kind of caught me a small bit off 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 guard that with that one all right um I, I suppose it, it, I I'm usually better at, at asking the questions than than answering them um, well the but, question is the answer <laughs> the question is the answer yeah I'll be thinking about that for the night I'll, I'll be trying to figure it out the 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 Professor Mark Brown, Ireland's first chair in digital learning and director of the National Institute for Digital Learning in Dublin City University. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always, to, to, to speak with you. Uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, interest, enthusiasm, and positivity. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Ken.